New America Foundation. Uh, I am Michael Calabrese, director of the Wireless Future Program uh, here at New America, and um, this is uh, this forum is has carries a rather provocative uh, title of America's 480 billion dollar spectrum giveaway, and uh, I don't know if there's any uh, any any revenue collectors here from the budget committees, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> but you may, you may leave with a, a bigger appetite than you came in with. Um, the um, access, I think as, as, as many folks around the room who I, I recognize from other spectrum battles know, access to the public airwaves is perhaps the most uh, valuable natural resource in the information age. Certainly, you know, the Department of Commerce has, has said, and it's certainly true, it's uh, worth well over one trillion dollars in market value, and that's just the lower end of it that's most frequently used. But unlike other public resources, things like uh, public land and oil, forests, uh, that are owned by the public, um, it's, it's really a, a very murky area. Uh, as Jim mentions in his paper, uh, in fact, there's a, a well-known uh, uh, book from many years ago that calls Spectrum, the, the title is The Invisible Resource. And that's true both literally and politically. I mean, literally because it's nothing more than the electromagnetic properties of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and so it's, it's nothing we can really see, or even when we talk about dicing it up in, in kilohertz, megahertz, and gigahertz, we're like, what's that? And then, you know, the public certainly doesn't understand that very well. And politically, because the, the FCC historically, you know, has been a very opaque agency that's really, uh, you know, a classic iron triangle that's taken on the role of, of simply refereeing between powerful industries and for the most part ignoring uh, the public interest. So the, the huge amounts of money at stake and the public's lack of awareness, either both technically and politically create the classic conditions for special interest politics. And that's what uh, Jim really um, pulls the veil on in this report, uh, you know, which for him is, uh, you know, and, and for our program, I think is a culmination of, of, of watching this over the past uh, nearly six, roughly six years, uh, because we've been involved in a lot of these battles, and, and this report, uh, you know, really sums up you know much of what uh, much of what much of what we've seen in terms of the spectrum politics playing out. The report is also very timely, as the you know as currently uh, very much in the news. The FCC is is right now writing the auction rules for the 700 megahertz band. These are the TV you know some of the, some of the TV channels uh, that are uh, that are being cleared of broadcasting thanks to the DTV transition deadline of February 2009 and being auctioned. Uh, Jim's report emphasizes, um, for example, that even, even here, even where there is an auction, um, uh, that you basically have windfalls uh, that can even occur because of the auction rules, and that's one thing that we're currently fighting on. For example, the auctions that occurred last year. Uh, you know, with the FCC because of the lack of anonymous bidding, uh, for example, it sets it up so that incumbents uh, can get a hold of, of these licenses, block uh, new market entrants, and even acquire the licenses for less uh, than they should be worth. So we're actually fighting, you know, currently to, to shape the rules for this coming auction so that you have anonymous bidding, so that you have some of the licenses conditioned on wholesale access by competitors, both you know nationally and locally, and consumer choice in terms of the basic consumer protections of the Carter phone rules, the basic consumer device attachment rules that apply in the wireline world, extending that to wa to wireless. Uh, it's also worth noting that this TV band that's being auctioned later this year would and which is expected to generate 15 to 20 billion dollars for the Treasury, we would not even be having this auction now if the incumbents, incumbents had had their way uh, six years ago. At the very outset of our program, 
th there was a, an effort by the broadcasters who had warehoused all this unused TV spectrum, and, and that's one of the things Jim emphasizes in, a report, in his report. Um, and by the way, I, you know, hopefully you all got it. It's, it's outside here, and this is the you know, preliminary version, which will be uh, printing up much more nicely and, 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 uh, and, and getting out to, to you by mail later. The, uh, in, that, in the report, Jim emphasizes you know, the license modifications that have yielded windfalls, but he also uh, talks about you know, a concept called warehousing, where incumbents try to keep spectrum uh, set aside, underutilized, until a time when they can monetize it. And this current ban, that's, that actually almost happened. There was uh, an effort by the broadcasters to, uh, to have a special auction uh, in 2002, where they would have received, where they would have been paid directly by the cell phone companies and others, and have captured probably 10, 10 or more billion dollars from uh, the total in the auction. And Congress, after that was sort of the initial high-profile effort of of our program, which we called the you know the Great Spectrum Robbery, and and there was a bill that was uh, signed by President Bush. <laughs> Uh, the night before the auction was to take place, canceling it uh, and, uh, and, and stopping that particular giveaway. Uh, then came the DTV transition uh, legislation uh, and then, you know, these current auctions. So it really takes an, an incredible degree of vigilance, which is commonly, not commonly uh, present uh, in these rather esoteric uh, regulatory uh, maneuverings. So. Without further ado, let me bring up uh, Jim Snyder. Jim's going to present his paper, and then we're going to get uh, you know, a, a reaction and insights from our distinguished uh, uh, panel, who I'll, I'll introduce after, after Jim is, uh, is finished. So Jim is, is the research director uh, here at the Wireless Future uh, program, where he focuses on the policy implications of emerging information technologies in telecommunications, e-education, e-commerce, and e-democracy. Uh, he's the author of Speak Softly and Carry a Big Stick, uh, a, a book that really documented how the broadcasters uh, w you know, went about a lot of their spectrum politics. He has a PhD in political science and communications policy from Northwestern. And, and, I, and you know, I'd like to say one final thing, which is today is, is a bit of a going away for him. Uh, for Jim, who is uh, leaving New America uh, this summer to, uh, uh, you know, armed with his PhD to pursue uh, book writing and, uh, and, and, other, uh, and other academic pursuits. And, um, you know, I just want to, you know, give him a, a brief tribute because Jim has been with the Wireless Future program from its very beginning. In fact, appropriately enough, uh, when he moved over from being a, a fellow uh, a general fellow at New America, uh, the program was called the Common Assets Program. Uh, and we talked about something called the Information Commons. And it was really about protecting, you know, the commonly held assets, um, you, you know, that, that the American public has. And we became more and more uh, focused on, on the airwaves as, as being, you know, uh, you know, having such tremendous potential in a world going wireless. Um, as uh, when he was still a senior research fellow, Jim envisioned and implemented the Citizen's Guide to the Airwaves, which I'm sure many of you have already, which is, which is this kind of uh, beautiful thing which has been used in hundreds of classrooms and, and I, I see when I go to meetings hanging all over offices on the Hill and the FCC. In fact, we have some out on the table when you leave, uh, commemorative versions, right? It's a little out of date, but, but flat. Uh, flat uh, versions of this, which if you want to, uh, to have to, to hang up, uh, certainly feel free to, to, take, to take one. Um, Jim went on to, to be a central player in shaping the DTV transition, uh, which as I said, you know, over a year ago was signed by President Bush setting a hard deadline. The other half of that, um, still to come, is, is, make, is opening access to all of the empty TV channels because the vast majority of television channels in each market, even after the DTV transition, uh, you know, will not be in use. And, and so our proposal has been to make those available for un, unlicensed access so they can be shared 
you know, by all entrepreneurs, by all uh, consumers without going through an inter intermediary. Jim is without a doubt the most knowledgeable person in Washington on issues related to broadcast spectrum, as his, uh, as his book uh, you know, demonstrates, and I hope you'll read it. Um, he's always been quite a bit ahead of his time, maybe too much so in, in some cases. He wrote a consumer, a consumer guide to e-commerce in the, in, the, in the 1990s, uh, before, uh, in the early 1990s, before most people were even very much aware of the internet. Uh, and, and, you know, and was proposing uh, remedies for the DTV transition when there was certainly no uh, political will around town to do anything about it. Um, so I'm sure we're going to be hearing shortly about um, some of his, uh, his new, uh, new ideas to uh, revolutionize uh, e-democracy, e-commerce, and other things that, be, that begin with e-hyphen. Uh, so with all that, I want to say we, you know, we wish Jim all the best, and uh, bring him up here for this uh, presentation. Thank you, Michael. Uh, before I, I launch in the paper, just a, a little bit of context of, of where I'm coming from this. Uh, I tend to be a, a technological utopian. I see that uh, technology, in particular telecommunications, uh, is a driver of civilization and economic progress and all sorts of ways. So when politics intrudes its ugly head, and prevents technology from realizing its full potential, uh, it bothers me. And in the mid-90s, I was getting a PhD in American government, and I was casting about uh, you know, for a subject, and I you know, saw Spectrum and the broadcast ban. It was just a classic case of special interest politics. Here you have a resource worth billions and billions of dollars uh, that a small group of people have the ability to capture that value, and you have a public uh, that doesn't understand, as a consequence, doesn't care at all about uh, the distribution of this resource. It's just a, uh, the, it, it is the classic formula for special interest politics. And here, you know, I have attempted to document how that has, has played out in all sorts of s subtle ways. So now uh, we will, uh, this is a, a comment, Senator uh, Lautenberg. <laughs> makes, you know, we often forget, you know, uh, you know, spectrum is invisible, but it has great, you know, tangible value in terms of monetary value, which is a, you know, a central um, part of, of this paper. So uh, the report is divided into three sections. In the first part, I document uh, the magnitude of the spectrum giveaway, and I estimate uh, it's uh, between $140 billion dollars and $480 billion since 1993. Uh, uh, there are a lot of assumptions that go into this analysis uh, that can be disputed, uh, but the bottom line is there has been an incredible giveaway of spectrum rights in this country in the last few decades, and I demonstrate you know, how, 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 how that is. The second part is the art of spectrum lobbying. Uh, which is dear to me as a political scientist. How can it be that such a thing happens and it happens below the public radar to the extent uh, it has happened? That's sort of the, the central riddle of spectrum um, uh, politics. And then uh, about a third of the paper is devoted to public policy recommendations. And in particular, I introduced this concept of asset specificity that has not been part of the telecom debate in DC, but that I believe is vital uh, uh, that we begin to treat as a central concept. Uh, how can we minimize asset specificity uh, with spectrum technology as a fundamental public policy goal? So now let's look at the, uh, the first part, the spectrum uh, giveaway. Uh, the analysis is divided into four sections. First of all, how much spectrum has been granted to, for flexible commercial use since 1993? Uh, what is the value of that spectrum? Uh, how much, uh, in terms of government receipts, have we actually gotten uh, since the auction era began in 1993? And then, uh, you know, adding it all up to get to these numbers uh, I've already mentioned. So why did I pick uh, 1993? Uh, I picked 1993 because that was the, uh, the year that Congress decided that in the future uh, all new uh, licenses or, or uh, most new licenses uh, would be auctioned and that the era of giveaways would come to an end. Uh, uh, the auction era began after the, uh, the lottery era in the late uh, 80s. You may remember that uh, the, uh, the second set of mobile telephone 
licenses awarded by a lottery. You had hundreds of thousands of doctors and accountants, you know, uh, uh, filing these forms to, uh, you know, basically get a winning lottery ticket that was worth billions and billions of dollars cumulatively. And there was such outrage that you could get billions of dollars. People would get these 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 licenses and then they would flip them immediately and, you know, make millions of dollars. And it was really out of that outrage that the auction era began. And the, the theory back then was that in the future, most new spectrum usage rights would be auctioned. Well, a central point of, the, of this paper is that it has not happened at all. The vast majority of spectrum rights have not uh, been auctioned. They have been given away, mostly actually through minor modifications uh, of existing uh, licenses. Um, so um, uh, now, other reasons why 1993 is a good day. Almost all licenses have been renewed, right? or actually all licenses have been renewed uh, since 1993. The, the renewal itself is a major form of giveaway. Most leases for a fixed amount of time you have a comparative process at the end of it, uh, and the government gets you know something uh, additional. Uh, and then also, in every case, every major case, there has been uh, uh, a even for the licenses that were initially awarded before '93, a major modification <laughs> since '99. For example, in the TV broadcast ban, if broadcasters still only had the right to provide one analog channel, those licenses would be worth a tiny fraction of what they are today. Even the mobile telephone spectrum granted before 93, that was analog, and it was site-based licensing. If they hadn't gotten digital rights um, in the late 90s and geographic fle flexibility, those licenses would be worth a tiny fraction of what they were today. Now, the PCS license that were auctioned in the mid-90s did have that, but I'm talking about the, the licenses uh, uh, that were granted for free uh, before 93. And then I've just focused on the spectrum below 3 gigahertz to simplify my task. The argument there is uh, you know, the, the, the radio spectrum goes from 0 to 300 gigahertz, so this is roughly only 1% of the total spectrum, but it happens to be that almost all the value in spectrum is below 3 gigahertz. More than 90%, for example, of radio devices are below 3 gigahertz. So by limiting it that way, I greatly simplify the analysis, but I get the great majority um, of the value. So I estimate that there is uh, below 3 gigahertz, roughly 693 megahertz of what I call flexible use spectrum. Now this can be sort of subdivided into really truly flexible use spectrum, a spectrum that isn't quite fle uh, truly flexible. About 190 megahertz is truly flexible. That's what Verizon and T-Mobile and Sprint Nextel and, and AT&T use. And what I mean by flexible is uh, 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 putting it uh, to a use that the market values most highly, which is you know mobile telephone. That's a, 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 a. now there are many other bands that have a close to achieving full flexibility, but it might may take a decade. Like the recent AWS auction that was sort of promoted as full flexibility, but in fact all the incumbents don't have to be cleared off until <laughs> December of 2014. A lot of that spectrum, most of it, is not going to be used, be able to be used in the immediate future. The MMDS ITFS band, 195 megahertz. Uh, in theory, that's flexible, but in fact, all the incumbents have to get together and reband the band. That could take years before that happens, and so forth and so on. Uh, there are a lot of bands that sort of look like they will eventually be flexible. That was the intent, but it's going to take years before uh, that can really be pulled off. But anyway, I come up with this figure of 693 out of the 3 gigahertz. Now, another category uh, are the uh, uh, licensees that have geographical area rights, wide area rights, but don't really have spectrum flexibility, at least right now. And that would be the TV broadcasters or radio broadcasters. Turns out that's not that, that much spectrum compared to the flexible uh, 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 use spectrum. And central assumption is I believe that eventually they will get full flexibility. It's just going to be, they've already gotten an incredible amount since 1993, and they've got all sorts of proceedings at the FCC for them to get more flexibility. I'm pretty confident they will eventually. But I actually didn't include that in my, my calculation. And then there's a huge amount of guard band spectrum. You know, originally with the TV or radio section, you'd have one channel, and then you'd have lots of guard band to, to protect it. So for example, a TV channel is 6 megahertz, and you really, would, on average, need at least 24 megahertz of guard band spectrum to protect that. So just intuitively, we know there are uh, channels 2 to 69 to 67 TV channels. The average market in the United States had uh, 13 channels on a population weighted basis. The rest of the channels were guard band spectrum. And much of the debate of what's going on in spectrum policy today is new technology make those guards, put those guards bands into play. And who gets them? 
Okay, obviously the, uh, uh, the broadcasters want to, through what I call spectrum, Lebensstrom, uh, acquire the guard band spectrum. And they've done it quite successfully. For example, in the radio band, they've acquired the first adjacent channel. And there's a lot of this going on in all sorts of subtle ways. So anyway, that's another 227 uh, megahertz of spectrum. So now let's go on to um, uh, spe uh, 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 spectrum analysts, uh, you know, love to use the dollar per megahertz per pop figure for valuing spectrum. And that is, it, it's a small unit. This is standard metric that, you know, industry analysts use in their reports when they analyze spectrum transactions. So this would be uh, uh, how much per megahertz, which is a unit of bandwidth, per person in a market. So. Um, uh, if there's, uh, you buy a, a, a license for uh, 100 million and it covers uh, 100 million people in one megahertz, it's, uh, you know, a dollar per megahertz per, per, per pop. Uh, now, there's problems with that metric because there's a huge difference between buying spectrum in New York City and in, you know, rural Montana. Uh, the density is higher, the demographics are very different, and so it's really hard to go from megahertz per pop data to the type of national data that I, w I, I want to come up with comparables. So. A better metric is uh, taking the value of spectrum on a national basis. So uh, if you sell a, a national megahertz across the entire country, let's say $500 million is the value of a, a megahertz on a national basis. The problem with using this number is most of the national auctions have been, or all of them have been conducted by the FCC rather than the private market transactions. And they're almost all deeply flawed transactions, which I will go over. I mean, the FCC, there's all this hype in the trade press about all the money that the FCC done, but in almost every case has been some major flaw with the structure of the auction, and so those numbers are really, in my opinion, not accurate. So, what the data set I used in my paper is one that I have never seen in any telecom or spectrum policy paper, and it's a new data set. Only since 2001 did the Securities and Exchange Commission mandate that FCC licenses be individually um, placed on annual reports, the 10Ks file. So what I did is I used the Securities and Exchange Commission new requirements for the valuation um, uh, of spectrum. So uh, let's go on and uh, we're gonna talk first about the valuation of mobile telephone spectrum, discuss the apparent uh, anomaly of the AWS auction, uh, and then the value of the broadcast spectrum. So. If we just take the four largest mobile telephone companies and their values on their, on their 10Ks submitted to the Securities and Exchange Commission, look at this. Verizon has a value of their spectrum of $50 billion, a line item on their, in, uh, on, on their government file report, okay, which has to follow FASB rules, financial accounting standards. $120 billion, a line item for just the four major companies. So now, if we take the average amount of spectrum that they have, we can calculate uh, a, a, an estimate of roughly $2.28 a megahertz per pop. And that's a pretty high number compared to the most common uh, megahertz per pops we see today. It's about half of the peak. There was an auction of next wave spectrum for a little over $16 billion in 2001 and that was about $4.20 a pop. So this is less. Verizon in that auction bid $8.8 billion, and this figure may seem very large, but it's actually 25% less than the peak valuation. Um, in uh, in uh, Germany, they had an auction for about $46 billion, about the year 2000, because this is the DACOM. It was about four times this valuation. It was about $8 a megahertz a pop. They had one in England about the same time. It was a little over four for, I think it was uh, 20 billion or something like that. Um, uh, so anyway, I'm giving you a, a, a particular uh, context. It's high. Uh, this is the basic metric that I use for valuing um, the spectrum. So now, the AWS auction raised $13.7 billion. It's been hailed as, you know, a great success. Um, uh, the average value there was about 53 cents a megahertz per pop, which is about a quarter of the number that I'm using here. Since that's the most recent, and that was a national one, that has to be, you know, explained. So I think there are four, uh, you know, variables that help explain uh, the difference in valuation. One is the encumbrances. There were several thousand 
federal users. There's about 15 agencies that have licenses in that ban, and um, uh, they have to be cleared off before um, commercial users uh, can use that ban. And they do not have to be cleared off completely until December of 2014. Many of them uh, uh, have, you know, six years to, uh, to clear off. An additional little twist is because government use of spectrum is considered classified or sensitive information, they didn't actually have to disclose where uh, 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 their uh, licenses were. So you were asked to buy something without having complete information about exactly what you were getting. And another little twist is because uh, when you do you, mobile telephone, there's an upstream and downstream link. You only have to have one of the two links encumbered because if you can't do both sides of a call, you know, it doesn't do you any good. So that's one significant variable. And I had one of the top... Uh, uh, from one of the four companies, uh, t said you know her company would have bid twice as much if it wasn't in, in the company. They could get you know immediate access to the spectrum, and they knew exactly what they were doing. Another thing, which is this paper we've recently published, is when you have more than a hundred rounds in a relatively small number of paper, uh, people uh, you know you can signal in the early rounds of the auction. That you know uh, encourages collusion and blocking, particularly of new entrants and small players. You know, if you go after something I really want, I'll screw you on something else the big players can do. That's why we've advocated anonymous bidding. The result of, uh, of this type of signaling, you know, would tend to reduce demand and lower prices. I, I don't know how much, but it would have some, you know, effect. Uh, the AW auction also was for slightly higher frequency spectrum. In general, I treated all spectrum below zero and three gigahertz as equally valuable, but, but clearly spectrum between two and three gigahertz is less valuable than say, you know, between 50 megahertz, you know, and one gigahertz. So that's, you know, a factor comparing apples and apples. Um, and then the equipment, whenever you enter a new band, a virgin band, there's no market of equipment. So, you know, it takes a while to develop an equipment market. It's less valuable than going into, you know, a band like one of the mobile telephone bands where you have a huge international market uh, in equipment. I think this variable quite significantly is not going to be as significant in the future. WiMAX, for example, is a very flexible technology. It goes from, say, 1.7 gigahertz to 10 gigahertz. That's just going to allow new entrants to go into virgin bands at a much lower cost, you know, with uh, much lower economies of scale than, you know, was previ previously uh, possible. So anyway, that's the, the AWS auction. Here is the broadcast. Uh, this is radio and TV uh, broadcast. This comes out to $48 billion. For I think uh, 30, uh, about uh, 28 companies. Um, uh, obviously, this is you know a subset of all. There are you know 13 some thousand licenses. We got about you know 20 percent of them here, but these are the big ones. So uh, and also, private companies don't have to file you know SEC reports, so they're so they're not there. So this is a subset, but you know we're talking about big numbers. This is just the uh, the broadcast bands. Uh, for the valuation. Now, government receipts, this is really confusing because you know, journalists typically in the press reports the FCC auction results. And people forget that the auction results have relatively little with how much money the Treasury has gotten. So if you add up from the 80 some odd auctions uh, that the FCC is connected, you get a number of $59 billion. Okay. Well, how much has the Treasury taken in? Well, as of the end of 2006, they only took in $20 billion. How can you explain this $30 billion auction? Well, part of it is we haven't yet credited the AWS auction, but we won't credit the AWS auction completely for, you know, until at least after 2014, because we don't know how much we have to give back. You know, they have the Spectrum um, you know, Relocation Trust uh, Fund. I mean, we have a lot of of expenses that you know we're not quite sure what their magnitude is in terms of relocating folks. The sixteen billion dollars, for example, that was auctioned in two thousand and one, the government had to give back that auction because NextWave was able to protect its licenses in bankruptcy court. So we held the auction and then we had to uh, you know give it all back. There were a whole bunch of people that bid on on, on auctions and then they didn't have the money to pay up in the mid nineties and they'd give it and then they were re auctioned. So if you add up the fifty nine, there's a lot of double counting. So it isn't what it appears to be. But the Treasury numbers are also, you know, not, not accurate because of all these delays between when money comes in and when the Treasury recognizes it. And so I have bumped it up to about $40 billion based on a bunch of variables saying, this is what I think it's reasonable to expect the government to have gotten from its first 80-plus auctions 
uh, that it's had. So then the question is, well, what explains the discrepancy between $520 billion and, um, and the $40 billion? I, I'm saying a good portion of that discrepancy can be explained as, as a giveaway. Now, I deal with you know, other arguments to explain the discrepancy uh, in the paper, but I'm using this as my upper bound for how much has been given away. For the lower bound, I basically, all I did is for the 41 largest companies that have FCC licenses, I simply added up the value. So you saw 128 billion for the top, uh, well, 120 for the top four mobile telephone companies. If you add up the top 14 mobile telephone companies, it's 128. I mean, in other words, the top four are about 120 billion. If you add up the other uh, 10, it's only another 8 billion. So that's 128 billion. And then you add up the broadcast ban, and you, I got, you got 177. Since I'm only dealing with 41, there's three, more than 3 million FCC licenses. We're dealing with a tiny fraction of the total number. I added another 3 billion. So I, then I had 180 billion, and I took away 40, and that's my lower bound of $140 billion. Okay, so now I, I have to speed up here. I, 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 uh, we get to the second phase, uh, uh, the art of spectrum lobbying. Uh, the uh, critical thing is to understand the logic of, of, of spectrum lobbying. And w one way to understand the logic is in terms of uh, the two phases and the four stages of spectrum lobbying. And the critical thing that I focus on here is the uh, incumbents, licensees' incentive and ability to establish holdup power for themselves. Holdup power in a negotiation is when one party to the tr transaction can get the entire surplus from the negotiation between your reservation price and their net reservation price. They get the entire surplus. And this is what they do in a variety of clever ways uh, is uh, maximize their holdup power. And I show you how that's done. So the two phases of, of, of lobbying are first you've got to get the license. Okay? This is the, where you know, we almost focus all our scholarly attention on the reports is on the initial licensing phase through auctions or comparative whatever it is. I don't actually think that's very important. I think the really important stage is the license modification stage, which is an iterative stage. It goes on you know, in continuous cycles over uh, decades where the initial licensing phase only happens once. The great majority of the giveaways, spectrum giveaways, have occurred in the license modification stage rather than the initial license stage. That's a critical point. And even more important, going forward, there's not much spectrum between 0 and 3 gigahertz that hasn't already been licensed or assigned. The name of the game in the future is going to be, we got this one last 700 gigahertz, megahertz, excuse me, auction that everybody talks about as sort of one of the last. Well, yeah, it really is going to be about the last. And the name of the game going forward is almost completely the license modification game. But it actually has already been the name of the game. People just forget about that for whatever uh, 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 reason. So, you know, why do lobbyists love to get their rights to modifications rather than through licensing? I mean, a lot of licenses, you wonder, when broadcasters go from one standard definition channel to the rights to provide 10, or when digital radio folks get the first adjacent channel, I mean, why aren't they called new licenses? Why doesn't it go through an initial licensing phase? Well, incumbents hate uh, going through the licensing phase because it's comparative, it's a highly public process, the modification phase can be done very quietly under the public radi radar. You know, it's just a, a, a perfect method for special interest politics. So the, the, uh, the, the, the initial phase actually has two, has two uh, uh, stages. You, you identify a problem that you can solve, and then you solve it. This is the stage number three that I'm really interested in, is after you, you get your foot in the door, the negotiating situation dramatically changes because in its incumbent you can dramatically increase your holdup power. Uh, the political and economic costs of not getting what you want after you get your foot in the door with the license. So this is really what I focus on here is the first phase, not phase uh, 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 stage three, uh, how, how uh, incumbents can increase their negotiating power uh, after they get their foot in the door. The whole, the, whole, the whole game, of course, is you get your foot in the door, and then you know you, you can do what you want. People always have such a short-term perspective; they don't see the, the long-term strategic logic. So I think I've already explained uh, the concept of holdup. There's two parts. One is the political part, which is you know 
You increase your, uh, through a variety of things, your political power, which enhances your negotiating power. But a critical part here is the economic strategies to genuinely change the economics of not giving the incumbents of what they want, primarily through the use of polluting guard band spectrum. And what I emphasize the most is by uh, making sure there's a lot of asset specificity in the um, radio equipment that consumers buy and that the vendors have. And once you have a lot of asset specificity, your hold of power dramatically uh, increases. Uh, and Congress and the FCC simply aren't going to say not renew your license. So um, let's go now to uh, the economic strategies here. Um, asset specificity is the extent uh, to which an investment uh, 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 only has value uh, in the context of a specific transaction. So for example, if you build a ma manufacturing machine and it can only build a glove compartment for a specific manufacturer, that's a highly specific you know, asset. But if you build a machine that can stamp metal sheets for thousands of different companies and products, then you have a flexible machine. Uh, similarly, on, with a, 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 a cell phone, if you have a cell phone handset that only works with one vendor on one frequency, that's a highly specific asset. But if you have a smart radio that can go on many different vendors and many different frequencies, then you have a flexible. So that's one type of asset specificity. Uh, well, the two types are for customers. Uh, for example, in the DTV transition, the whole thing is we've got all these t uh, consumers with TV sets that we feel will be stranded, high asset specificity, if uh, we take broadcasting off the air. So that's a specific uh, smart radio. If they had smart t radio technology, you know, that would be um, the case. And then on, on a vendor side, uh, we often talk here about you know, investment uncertainty. A company builds uh, a transmitter that only works with their license and on their band. If you take that away, you know, you're creating you're, you're, uh, there are sunk costs, you're creating significant economic harm. If they have flexible transmitters, uh, then uh, it's uh, like when the government leases a building and you put in your own furniture and the lease expires, well, you take the furniture out and you go put in another building. You know, why can't we do this with spectrum equipment? Why do we have to treat it as this, uh, you know, incredible sunk investment that isn't transferable? So um, let's go on to the... Uh, uh, okay, uh, well, just cover, cover one more strategy, the pollution strategy. You know, a critical part is you get a lot of poor receivers out there that suck up the guard. You need, you need guard bands to protect uh, the, the transmissions in the primary uh, frequency. And w the way it works is you try to pollute as much guard band spectrum by having a lot of, say, poor receivers out there. And then you go to the FTC and say, look, this is an incredibly valuable resource that's wasted. Give it to us. We can internalize the cost, and we'll use you know the guard bands. So this is, for example, in the digital radio transition. That's exactly what they done. They said, well, nobody else can use the first adjacent channels without destroying the whole radio system. So give it to us, and let's not us use the first you know adjacent channel. We see the same thing with the white space proceeding at the FCC. The broadcasters say, oh, anybody who uses this white space will destroy TV. We're in other proceedings They're working, you know you know, very aggressively, clever, cleverly to acquire that white space for themselves. Um, and just, I'll, I'll, I'll actually go to two others quickly. The Louisiana Purchase Strategy, we always hear uh, come and say, oh, we hate investment uncertainty and ambiguity. Oh, no, no, no. Sometimes they do uh, 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 when it, well, sometimes like, uh, well, they, they love uncertainty when it helps them. When we purchased the Louisiana Purchase, there was a lot of ambiguity on where the lines were, which was great. Napoleon was preoccupied in Europe, and we were expanding on the lines you know, to the maximum extent. There's incredible ambiguity in the way licenses are, are done. For example, the broadcaster's protected area. Is it within the grade B, or is it the actual users of there? Well, they love the ambiguity because they want to have both. They want to have all the people in the grade B that aren't currently getting their service. They want to be able to expand to cover those people in outside the grade B. So anyway, uh, there, there's a huge incentive for ambiguity and a lot of resistance to eliminating ambiguity when, as a result, you minimize, you, you harm somebody's economic interest. And then lastly, the case-by-case -case waiver strategy. You have all these things done very at very low visibility uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, and then they come up for a rulemaking, and then you have all these facts on the ground. So recently, for example, the radio broadcasters got multicasting rights, but before they got formal rights, they had more than 800 waivers. 
you know, you had all this consumer equipment out there and whatnot. I mean, the, the SEC couldn't have all this equipment that consumers were using. It. Basically, by the time they actually made a decision through the Administrative Procedure Act, you know, it was a fait accompli. So uh, anyway, these are, a few, these are real economic forces that change the negotiating system. Uh, so now, there are two types of political communication strategies. There's one set to keep things below the public radar, and the second is um, uh, framing strategies. Uh, you know, a critical strategy is to go slow. Uh, you, 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 you change your rights over decades, over dozens of proceedings, one little step at a time. And each step, you know, it's not worth the New York Times putting it on the front page. I mean, it's just too trivial. That's right. Hundred million dollars here, a billion dollars there, and even the trade press. Oh, they can't be bothered. It's too small. But you know, you add up these you know, dozens of minor modifications, uh, and you know, over time, suddenly a TV broadcast license that was for three years with comparative review, all sorts of restrictions, forty years later, suddenly is a completely different beast. Uh, you're waiting for the next government, you know. Uh, governments change. There's, uh, 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 there's always a new excuse with each administration to get something you didn't get with the last one. Uh, you've got all these proceedings at the FCC that are presented as unrelated, like in the, in the white space proceeding, you have one proceeding about unlicensed use in the, in the broadcast ban. You've got four or five proceedings, uh, uh, other rulemakings, uh, where the, the broadcasters are trying to acquire that spectrum for themselves, and they're treated as completely unrelated, and they're framed in these technical terms that the press and the public and the public interest groups have no idea how intricately related they are, and, but this is very effective, because on the one hand, they're saying, oh, if you use the guard band spectrum, you'll create intolerable interference, and in these other side of proceedings, they say, oh, give it to us, we can maximize service to the public if you give it to us. Um, you know, all these things, many of these things are public, but they're described in such technopath. You have to have a PhD in spectrum technology to have any idea what's really going on. So that's a, 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 a critical element. And I just, since we're short on time, uh, 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 in terms of, uh, sometimes, you know, you need to have arguments to give you political cover for these things. So these are some of the types of, well, you know, widespread political cover arguments you get, you know, all the time. One is, well, it's already happened. The giveaways already happened. So, you know, why cry over spilled milk? And, you know, we just have this one little additional minor modification that we want to add. Now, forget that, that they've been saying this for decades, and this is not the last minor modification. There's going to be ten more minor modifications in, in the future. But anyway, this is a very popular article. Two wrongs make right. Well, this has been going on for so long, you, you know, uh, the lobbyists have certain expectations. You damage their expectations, you know, if you change it, but, you know, this has been going on so long, it's unfair to change it. Two wrongs make a right. Political inevitability, very popular. I mean, this is, you know, in DC, this is the easiest way to shut down people. Oh, this is hopeless. You're not going to go up against the broadcasters or the mobile phone companies or whatnot. These are, you know, you know why waste your time? Uh, this is, you know, in the back rooms, a constant issue, what is politically feasible, and it really completely shuts down the debate and, and leads to, you know, just incredibly infantile, stupid debates, if I might say, because of, you know, the logic of political inevitability. So the save by killing, I, I just, you know, love this. It happens all the time. People say, oh, if you let me migrate out of my existing business, you'll save my existing business. So in IPFS spectrum, that was 120 megahertz for educational purposes. They said, for example, you know, let us use it for mobile broadband, you know, so we can, you know, enhance our service. Well, we did it in the name of enhancing the service, and they just killed off. They just, you know, uh, uh, sublet their spectrum to a commercial provider and completely got out of the business. Broadcasters, you know, are always talking about preserving free TV, while when you actually look at the concrete steps and rules, you know, they're killing it as fast as they possibly can. The idea is they can subsidize free TV with these non-free TV services. Uh, anyway, it's, it's really amazing how this logic, uh, you know, play, uh, plays out. You have these completely artificially restrained uh, options. There's always the status quo and the incumbent comes in with another set of options. Uh, and, you know, all these other options are excluded and it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, but, you know, the FCC doesn't have the time to think about other options, and other groups don't have an interest or ability to come up with other options. This relates to the use of standards bodies captured. You know, they're very important in the legislative, in the, in the FCC process. They're highly secretive, even though there's a lot of companies involved. And the standards create options that are highly constrained in terms of, you know, the public interest standards. So, um, 
Now let's come to the conclusion here. I apologize. I, I'm going to uh, go through uh, 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 this uh, quickly. Uh, the, the two categories are to increase the, you know, the transparency uh, and change the economics, specifically the asset specificity associated uh, with uh, spectrum policy. Uh, we, we need to have a clear accounting system for spectrum assets. We have the NTIA, which actually manages most spectrum. That's the federal government, the Department of Defense, the Department of Transportation, the FAA, Department of Agriculture. They all have huge amounts of spectrum. But it isn't integrated. First of all, it's not public. Most of it's classified. And the FCC has several different databases. We need an integrated database. But most important, when we have rulemakings and there's a minor modification, an economic value has to be attached to it. We have all these technical debates. And there's never a discussion in these proceedings, well, what is the cost to the public of making these technical modifications? How much resources are we giving away? That's not the way it's structured. The GE, oh, I'm not going to skip that. Uh, we have a serious problems of the people writing these regulations, as with many agencies, they write them and then they go work for the companies that they're regulated. And the TV broadcast was in Bruce Franco went from writing the proceeding directly to STB lobbying. And I, you know, my paranoid mind, I was like, you keep putting a lot of poison pills there. I mean, why are these poison pills and these obscure footnotes and whatnot? Well, maybe he was thinking he was going to go to MSTV and those poison pills were, I mean, I don't know, but you have a lot of this. And I think we need to have uh, a, 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 a more restrictions on the revolving, that the amount of money is so great on spectrum policy and the discretion is so much, we have to bend over backwards to ensure the integrity of the process. You know, we have all the, uh, reduce the number of uh, different bans, we have all these obscure ban proceedings that the public interest community and the public and the press just simply can't follow. If we could just simplify the FCC ban plan, you know, a little bit, it would be easier for the public to get involved in the process. This is sort of, you know, the move away from command and control, the flexible spectrum. Part of that vision is to reduce some of the complexity of the ban plan. But there's a real political consequence, too, to having the current complexity. So we need a much simplified ban plan so the public can actually find it worthwhile to get involved uh, in the process. Um, uh, I think we need to begin to think of spectrum, and this is one reason we have some of the panelists here, as a natural resource like other natural resources, rather than something exotic. The same basic principles that apply to the management of other natural resources, we've got to think about spectrum. And it's interesting, the way the CBO works, the way the general accounting office, they don't have the natural resource people, you know, do, it's, it's treated as something else. But I think we need to think increasingly of spectrum as a natural resource like other natural resources. Uh, one little pet peeve of mine, when you get a license, particularly when you get unfavorable terms, there's often these build-up requirements. And there's the, the sort of this professional wrestling or this whatever it is, the, 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 the people who get the license always promise to build out rapidly. And then quite frequently, they don't do it. And either they go to the FCC and ask for an extension, or quite often the FCC doesn't pay any attention and they just don't build out. This could easily be automated with modern technology. It's just like you have an odometer that measures, you know, when you put in a broadcast tower and you say you're going to broadcast at a certain power, well, there's a little device there. We have an internet that records what your power level is and a few other parameters, and then it can be automatically reported. Most of these build out things, the monitoring can be done, can be automated. The FCC says it doesn't have the resource. To, uh, uh, to, to do these, but it's, I think it would be a trivial problem to solve the build-up problem. And then um, the, the FCC's Inspector General, you know, simply does not do his job in terms of wasting, you know, ferreting out waste, fraud, and abuse. You know, the biggest giveaways in waste, they just, it's not part of the purview. He deals with micro-irrelevant stuff. The big stuff, you know, they studiously ignore. And then lastly here, um, uh, uh, the economic uh, arguments. If we reduce asset specificity, it would be the strongest argument, for, in my opinion, for reducing automatic renewal of license. Because the key argument against it is if somebody has invested a lot in their spectrum infrastructure, you can't take the license away. It would result. But if you can reduce dramatically the asset specificity, which I believe can be done, then the, the arguments for this automatic renewal uh, are much weaker. We need to mandate strict receiver standards to eliminate all the spectrum pollution uh, that's out there. The FCC has you know, begged Congress to allow it to mandate receiver standards. You know, 
Congress doesn't want. The way it works is incumbents love receiver stands where they can acquire the guard band spectrum themselves, like in the recent DTV converter box. They're enhancing the standards, but only to the extent that the incumbents can capture the value. When anybody proposes uh, enhanced receiver stands so the public can capture the value, you know, it never goes anywhere. Um, the SEC needs to periodically report on changing asset specificity. I mean, people don't know your laptop today has uh, uh, unlicensed, or, or will soon have, between 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz. Many of them now have um, mobile telephone cards that go from uh, uh, 846 megahertz to 1990 megahertz. Uh, GPS they have in them, uh, Bluetooth they have in them. Increasingly, they will have a, a UWB, ultra wideband, that goes from 3.1 gigahertz to 10 gigahertz. They will have WiMAX in them. Uh, the next year, Intel is going to uh, put WiMAX. It goes from 1.7 uh, gig, uh, gigahertz to 5.8, and the, pr the, the standard goes up to over 10. In other words, we are beginning to see incredibly smart, versatile machines that if they can't be used for one, also TV. And radio, 54 gigahertz to 846, all built into one small consumer laptop. So that may seem like a lot, but actually the military is developing a smart radio that goes from zero to 30 gigahertz. Up and down, the whole dial, you know, reading, you know, any standard, very expensive. But, you know, we need to keep track of to what extent we're moving away from the current dumb radio model to a smart, because it has huge policy implications. So that's a critical variable. Uh, now, my argument is that asset specificity really hurts small businesses. Uh, 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 one of the major costs of spectrum, getting into spectrum is not just buying a frequency, but getting equipment for it. Today, you have to really vertically integrate if you're opening up a new frequency or take a major investment or spend huge amounts of money developing the equipment infrastructure. Suddenly, we're moving into, a, say, a WiMAX world where you have a standard that goes from 1.7 to 10 gigahertz, you don't have to invent the standard. You have an off, you can buy the spectrum. You have an off-the-shelf uh, product to use. It dramatically changes the economics um, uh, of spectrum. And uh, I would say far more than designated entities, credits, uh, and other things that I think have been fair because they don't address the fundamental economics that allow small players into the spectrum business. We can reduce asset specificity, which completely change the barriers to entry and allow smaller entry. Uh, entry. You know, we hear all this on the, uh, the Department of Homeland Security. You know, interoperability. You know, the fire guys couldn't talk to the police guys. They didn't have flexible radios. Well, let's go to the next step. Let's really create. You know, so if even if all the public broadband, the, the the public bands. Are, are, are not in use. They have smart radios. They could use the, you know, the commercial private ones. You know, at a minimum, they should have, you know, unlicensed spectrum in all of their, you know, radio chips. They should, you know, integrate them into one set of chips. The uh, ITU, the SEC, and local municipalities need to think about um, uh, asset specificity uh, in their radio equipment purchases. You know, the light post is becoming a, a critical resource in the future. I would argue it's the most critical telecom spectrum resource in the future because we're going to have very small cells. They should put smart radios, you know, um, uh, 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 on those cells. A, a bigger issue is it's illegal to build a truly smart radio that goes from 0 to 3 gigahertz today because you have to get an FCC authorization for each band, and you can't get authorizations for certain bands. And it gets even like more of a mess because each country has different bands that you can't get authorizations on. So we have a real fundamental problem with our rules in developing these, uh, uh, these smart radios uh, 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 going forward. So uh, I'm going to uh, leave it at that. I'm already over uh, uh, my time. Uh, but there actually are quite a few other policy recommendations. We're moving to a whole new you know, set of technologies and economics with all sorts of policy implications. We need to take advantage of them going forward. All right. Thanks, Jim. And, and as you can no, no doubt tell, the, the report is quite, uh, quite comprehensive. And you know, I'd really encourage you to, to dig into whichever aspect of it is, uh, uh, is, is most interesting. So, so, so next we'll have uh, three uh, reactions. Uh, and, and some different perspectives on, you know, on, on, on the report and, and this whole issue. So first up is, is Drew Clark, uh, who joined the uh, Center for Public Integrity 
uh, last August as head of the Well Connected Project, uh, which is tracking the influence of, of money on, on, on media and telecom issues. Uh, Drew came from the National Journal Group, where he's been a, he was a journalist, uh, senior writer there, and a driving force behind National Journal's Tech Daily since 1998. Drew? Yeah, and uh, as Bob Edgar mentioned, uh, I w went to Swarthmore College, and, and this man was my congressman. So, uh, <laughs> um, so I, I uh, uh, was, was grateful for the chance to be on the panel for that reason, but, but uh, particularly grateful for the chance to be on this panel because Jim's work is uh, a great work that I've admired very much. In fact, uh, years ago when I was writing uh, my own piece, Spectrum Wars, about the politics of this issue, I, I relied extensively on his work, and although I was able to get a reference to New America's uh, work, I did not mention him by name, and I, uh, I was very chagrined that it got uh, cut by an editor. So um, I really have uh, followed what he writes very closely because he does such a good job at it. And, and this is a very complicated area such that you know, even the, the, the people that, that they, they call experts, and I certainly don't consider myself one, uh, are, are absolutely not. Uh, what I'm trying to do as a journalist is to explain this issue uh, to, to the public so that the public can be involved in this, in this discussion. And that's really what um, the, the work I do at the Well Connected Project of the Center for Public Integrity, and we have some materials on the uh, table out there, is all about. We are a nonprofit investigative journalism project, and we have uh, three major components. Uh, one is a database, which we call the media tracker, that allows anyone to type in your zip code and find who owns the media, telecom, cable, newspapers. We're trying to get broadband records as well from where you live. We also do investigative reports, building off the data, the, the campaign contributions and the lobbying expenditures and the lobbying visits that these companies make to the FCC, as well as uh, blog entries. And we've just recently, last week, uh, launched a, um, a, a partnership with uh, Congresspedia, which is effectively a, a citizen's guide to issues. And we are uh, working with them on the telecom media and intellectual property portal. So um, what I wanted to do in my short opportunity to reflect on Jim's paper is uh, point out three things that I think are great about the piece, uh, throw out one question that maybe Jim and others could, could, uh, could, could deal with, and then close with two observations that um, I, I would hope uh, could help drive the debate forward on this subject. And as Jim and Michael mentioned, it's very timely for us to be considering this now because the FCC is in the midst of uh, designing the rules for the 700 megahertz auction. And this is you know, very widely regarded as beachfront property. It's the, uh, the best spectrum in terms of its propagation characteristics, its ability to penetrate walls and buildings, tall, uh, tall buildings, trees, et cetera. And so it's, it's definitely uh, very prized uh, for a number of reasons. Um, well, so what I really liked about uh, Jim's piece and his work generally is his extensive documentation of spectrum, where it is, what it's valued at, and, uh, and, and you just kind of ferreting it out because, as he pointed out, no one else is doing it. There's not an accounting of our spectrum assets uh, the way we have an accounting of our land assets or accounting of, of uh, you know, our labor assets or, or other assets that, that are uh, part of our, our economy. He, um, he, he, he documents, you know, very carefully uh, the, the spectrum, and I think it's definitely worth just recapping briefly. I mean, what he's done in this paper is to take, you know, three chunks of spectrum worth more than $10 billion each. Uh, the, the, the flexible use uh, spectrum, um, 693 megahertz, and, you know, I guess just to simplify, I mean, Basically, a TV channel is worth six megahertz, is, is, takes up six megahertz of space, or it has traditionally taken up six megahertz. So that's, you know, effectively like, you know, 120 TV channels <laughs> worth of, of bandwidth in the air. Uh, then he, he, he tackles the wide area but not flexible use spectrum, which is effectively uh, what broadcasters are squatting on and not using, 
uh, it's, they're not using these 88 megahertz at all, but it's, it's in the zone around what they use. So, so it, it's kind of particularly good to, to get a handle on that one. And then, um, uh, well, actually, I'm, I'm sorry, I just made a mistake. That 88 megahertz is what they do use. It's the 227 megahertz that they don't use. So those are two separate uh, calculations important to get a handle on to help better understand, you know, what's used, what, where it's valued at and um, what's wrong with those valuations. Um, the second thing he really does that's, that's great is he itemizes um, some of the, the uh, you know, just kind of all of the, the giveaways that have gone on or are going on now. I think he's got a section here on, on 10, top 10 giveaways, and it's wor maybe worthy of a, a Letterman routine if uh, it could just be translated <laughs> properly. Um, and, I mean, and he, he really goes through these things that, that it's true. I mean, I... As a, as a journalist and, and, and others who are writing on these things don't pay enough attention to, you know, metro TV broadcasters, rural TV broadcasters, uh, AM and FM radio broadcasters. Each of these separate initiatives is a separate lobbying battle. And, and so what he's really done, his work, is to really put, your, put his finger on the special interest politics that is ripe in the, uh, in the spectrum world. Uh, it's, I mean, economists refer to it as rent-seeking because when an asset is available uh, because you're the best lobbyist or because you're able to persuade the right person in Congress or in the FCC, you may get something that you wouldn't otherwise get. And then the third thing he does that, that I found very valuable is his suggestions with regard to making things more transparent um, on, on um, the spectrum front. And this, again, ties in with what we're interested in at the at the Center for Public Integrity's Well Connected Project. He talks about improving the accounting rules for tracking spectrum uh, assets, reducing conflicts of interest rules, um, re requiring Congress to allocate spectrum uh, usage grants. I mean, instead of the FCC, that's, that's an interesting one that, that you know, maybe gives a little more political accountability to these decisions. Uh, integrate the management of spe spectrum assets into other natural resources, which I touched upon. So those are three things that I found very, very rewarding about this paper. Uh, maybe the question I want to throw out is this $48 billion figure that he talked about briefly. And, uh, you know, again, he does something that, that I hadn't seen anyone else do, which is go to the SEC documentations by these companies and get what they say their valuation of this, what they, they the broadcasters say is their valuation. And they said it's $48 billion. Now, when the the mobile companies did this. They, I believe, have less spectrum, but in any case, they certainly have less desirable spectrum, and they ta ta tabulate their assets as $128 billion. And those two figures together, $177 billion um, minus uh, the money the Treasury has received, is the basis for Jim's lower or more conservative giveaway calculation of $140 billion. He has the larger calculation that he's walked through, and I won't repeat that for the 480 billion. I guess my question would be, and, and let me just specifically highlight the, the section that I that I that I ask this based upon, where he where he notes that um, On page 15, he says that the value of a license to use spectrum, if allocated for fixed terrestrial broadcast service, is substantially less than if it were allocated with the flexibility to provide mobile telecommunications services. Thus, in the broadcast bands, we have to clearly distinguish between the opportunity costs of the spectrum and its current value to incumbent licensees. So I, my question is, where do you account for that opportunity cost? That, that I didn't find in the paper, because this $48 billion is just what the broadcasters say is the value, but I think its value is many, many times more, and so hence the opportunity cost of keeping that in the hands of the broadcasters without some vehicle for it to go somewhere else. Whatever that else is, we should talk about, but unless there's some vehicle, then that opportunity cost is going to be, is going to be locked. And so I really want to kind of get Jim... Uh, talking about that one, um, and then maybe just sort of to slide into two concluding observations, 
Uh, I just posted a piece today on our website at the Center for Public Integrity, which I titled Back to the Paper Bag. And uh, I I'm building off of what uh, uh, Senator, former Senator Bob Packwood said about the NAB in 1982. He said, the NAB can't lobby its way out of a paper bag. Now, uh, that, that, uh, that, that statement has, has probably been disproved by the broadcaster's actions over the next decade or so. But I think that the fact that the broadcasters effectively lost the digital television transition debate, there is a hard date. It is February 17th, 2009. That uh, is, by all accounts, uh, a firm date, not going to get changed. Uh, and so, so then the question becomes, uh, you know, what about the other 294 megahertz in the air? Broadcasters are effectively seeding 108 megahertz, or a, a quarter of the space they currently use. But when more than 85% of the population receives its television over cable or over satellite, I, I think that question is going to be even more salient over the next decade or so. What about the other 294 megahertz? Is there some better and higher use for that spectrum? I, I think there is. I'd like to explore and sort of ask people to, to sort of put forward their ideas of how you could get to that world where that would be, be better used. And so I guess maybe my last concluding thought is, is to reference the work of, uh, of Ronald Coase, who uh, won the Nobel Prize for Economics uh, for his Coase theorem uh, about property rights and the use of property rights. I'm not sure as many people know that Coase got his idea for the Coase theorem because he studied the Federal Communications Commission in the 1950s and saw what a mess the system of allocating frequencies was at the time. Uh, you know, we, we had then and still largely have today a command and control system, which means that the FCC makes the decision based on many factors, but lobbying becomes a very important factor. So uh, Jim referred to the flexible property rights usage that many of the wireless carriers enjoy, again, versus the command and control. And now, of course, increasingly there's smart radio technology, which uses a commons uh, model. And, and of those three models, command and control, flexible property rights, and commons, I think there's widespread agreement that uh, while we may not know what's the right allocation between the flexible property rights and the commons, they're, they're both likely to be a lot better than the command and control system. So with that, I'll uh, turn it on to uh, the All right, person. thanks, Drew. We'll go next to former Congressman Bob Edgar. Uh, Dr. Edgar is... Uh, the relatively new uh, president and CEO of Common Cause, congratulations. Uh, he, he came to Common Cause from the National Council of Churches where he was a general secretary and, and you know, I think as most folks know, uh, served in, uh, in Congress, initially elected in 1974, and his experience uh, running for the Senate in Pennsylvania uh, you know, in 1986, I think. Uh, I came in you know, second. <laughs> came in second. Gave him a lot of the impetus he has to clean up our, uh, our money and politics system, which is what Common Cause is all about. And I should note, too, that my thanks to Common Cause uh, this past year, you know, year or so has, has joined uh, with us on the, uh, on, on the spectrum and broadband issues as well, particularly on this TV white space issue that, that Drew has been focusing on. You know, what are we going to, you know, this vast wasteland of empty. TV spectrum, can we get, you know, good public use out of it? Well, I had a much longer statement that I was going to make, but um, I, I wonder if we could give a round of applause to, to Jim and Drew, who really love footnotes and who, uh, <laughs> I was president of a graduate school for 10 years and I had a group of faculty who got promoted because of their ability to write books with lots and lots of footnotes and I wanted to have people from uh, Yale and Harvard and Duke and uh, SMU and all those fancy places who could act just like this gentleman did and just like uh, our colleague here from Swarthmore College did and be smart enough to understand all this technology. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> um, and you mentioned that Common Cause is involved, and but you mentioned that I and president of Common Cause, and I've left National Council. Actually, for July and August, I'm both general secretary of the National Council of Churches and, which has a communications commission, and I'm president until 
uh, I start full time in September of, of Common Cause. And um, I have a, two illustrations I'd like to do. First, I'd like to have all of the intern staff and others from Common Cause that are here stand up just so that the rest of the audience can see how much we care about the issue. Would you just stand real quickly so we could see how many are here? Now, they're here voluntarily, which I think is uh, a, a, a pretty good thing. I was wondering. Um, but I show that simply to say we don't bring to this debate the footnotes. In fact, when I heard the presentation, I was reminded of the story of the mother mouse that's walking across the field, and she has behind her her baby mice, all the little Mises, and she's just as happy as can be. She gets about halfway across the field, and you guessed it, a large cat comes in the other direction. She stands up on her back legs, she looks the cat in the eye, and she says, bow wow, and the cat runs off. And the mother mouse turns to the little ones and says, now you know the value of a second language. <laughs> My experience as clergy, as congressman, as president of a graduate school, as someone who's run a few associations, is that we absolutely positively need the kind of analysis that you've done in this work. And we need the ability to know who are the smart people who can read all of this stuff and listen to it, think about it in a language that others of us simply can't respond to. When I was a member of Congress, things that came out of the Ways to Be Mean Committee made my <laughs> eyes glass over. But I knew they were important, dealing with Social Security or Medicare or, or tax policy. What we've demonstrated, I think, in the report, what you've demonstrated specifically, is the importance of this in terms of not the megahertz, not the spectrums, but the mega dollars that, in fact, the larger public is losing, and the revolving door of uh, House and Senate members and staff moving into these fields and vice versa that I think we have to, to look out for. So this is an important time for citizen lobbies to understand that this is a, not only an invisible resource, but we've got to generate some resource recovery. We've got to figure out how to tell the story in a way that average ordinary common people can understand it. That's not easy. Uh, I've spent my life trying to interpret Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. That's not easy either. Uh, but you give us some framework to do it. My hope is that some of the folks here in the room and others in the, um, in the nonprofit sector who care about these issues will figure out some stories to tell so that average ordinary citizens across the country can get passionate about these issues, can see it as a, a national resource. Secondly, I hope we can shed light on it. Uh, you made an important point in your presentation that the light is almost on, but perhaps dim in the area of initial licensing, but the lights are out when it comes to modification of uh, the stages. And, and I think we need to figure out how we can get flashlights focused in on those modification stages. I think also a second issue that we can help with is accountability and transparency, uh, very important issue. And finally, I, I think that the goal for all of us is to protect all of this unlicensed spectrum uh, for public use and see it as a public good. And I think that's where we have a common cause uh, to work uh, together. Uh, obviously, it's not going to be easy. and. I'm sure if you wanted to stay later, I'll recite the words I was supposed to say. But I think the bottom line is, let's work together on accountability and transparency. Let's translate this technical data, which is good, into language that average ordinary people can understand. And let's shed light on both the licensing stage, number one, but particularly on those things behind the scenes. Uh, one of my staff said it reminds us a little bit of New York City licensing hot dog stands and then giving um, you know them the opportunity to build skyscrapers next door and uh, you know we've got to figure out what are the 
what, what's the common language that we can use so that the general public is as outraged about this as they are about many other things? And what if we use some of this resource that we recovered uh, to make our health care system work? What if we use some of it to have quality public education? What if we use some of it to address issues like global warming? Uh, everybody says there's not enough money to do the things that are important to poor people and to the general public. I think there's probably a lot of money if we do the resource recovery that you call for. Okay. Thank you, Bob, and, it, and it's, it's great to have Common Cause uh, in, this, in this fight with us. Uh, our last, uh, our final panelist here is, is Gary Bass, who is the executive director of OMB Watch, which he founded in 1983. Uh, and o OMB Watch works to increase government transparency and accountability through regulatory reform and other, and other activities. And I, you know, I know I've worked with them over many years, and, and, and they're incredibly effective. Uh, Gary? Well, for, first of all, I'm excited I'm using wireless right here. Um, so I'm making use of my spectrum. Um, let, me, let me also start with a confession. I am not a technologist. I don't know the first thing about all this stuff. And when I first heard the, me the word megahertz, I thought of big boo-boos of some kind, a megahertz, as I thought I was talking about kids, you know. And so I, I don't even speak the language of all this uh, guard band stuff. Um, I thought guard band had something to do with, first I thought it was something about a doghouse, and then I thought it was maybe protecting somebody with national security, and then I learned from, from you, Jim, that it had to do with the space in between. Um, but all of this is just overwhelming, uh, just overwhelming. When I read his eye-popping paper, um, all I could think of is really the example of what would be our reaction if we gave away or sold the interstate highway to General Motors and then General Motors decided which cars got on the highway and which didn't? That's unacceptable. And that's the same analogy as with Spectrum. It is unacceptable to have something that is ours be given away and sh controlled in the manner of giving away, say, a highway system to General Motors. That is just flat out wrong. I think that Bob did an, a great job of summarizing the very same kinds of issues that I would raise. I think it's absolutely critical to frame this issue in a way that the public can understand. We should begin talking about the commons. The spectrum, like the land, like the air, like our water, are all resources that we, the people, own. Let's recapture, re rekindle that spirit of the we, the people, that helped found this country. Let's also begin an education process, as Bob was talking about, and stop talking the technobabble. We play right into that technobabble. Thirdly, let's not just talk about the rights to the spectrum, let's talk about the use of the spectrum itself. There needs to be this kind of model about open access. We need to define what that is. But the kinds of standards that, that Jim was talking about and other kinds of issues, I no longer want to have a situation where when I change my carrier, I have to go buy a different phone. Enough of that. Fourthly, the accountability that was talked about throughout this uh, panel is essential. We're talking about not just what has been given away, we need to talk about the minor modifications, quote unquote minor modifications, that Jim was talking about as we go forward. I asked Jim a simple question. How much money are we talking about going forward? And while he couldn't give me a precise answer, at least we're talking about something in the realm of $100 billion over the next 10 or 15 years. $100 billion. I could use that money to make sure that every kid in this country who is not receiving insurance gets covered in insurance and have enough money left over to reduce the taxes that we pay on our cell phones and other kinds of wireless communication devices. That is our money and we should be collecting it. Finally, transparency which has been the theme on this panel needs to be done. We need to start making sure that the kinds of recommendations that Jim puts in his paper, we have the mechanisms to verify 
what is it, trust but verify, was the line that Ronald Reagan used. Let's apply it. On top of it, we have to not just have the transparency, but we need the enforcement mechanisms. Michael, you started with the whole notion about what was the, the name you gave it, the great spectrum robbery? I think that proves the point that if we, the people, begin to take on this issue once again in the way that Bob Edgar was talking about, we too can stop the great train robbery as we are moving forward. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Um, running qu around the end of our time, but um, I'd like to take a couple questions. You know, feel, people could feel free to certainly filter out, but uh, when we get a few questions in, and obviously even after that, uh, the, the panel will be will be up here. And could you identify yourself, though? Uh, my name is Ty. I'm from Washington Analysis. I'm an intern. And um, I just have a question regarding the uh, phase out of the analog bands. Um, first off, is that a hard and fast date, February 2009? I think it is. I hope it is. Okay. Um, is there a reason why they have to phase it out in order to use the respect? Well, it's, 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 it's in the statute, and the, the purpose is to free up uh, spectrum. So it's, it, there's been a 10-year, as it's turned out, a 10-year process to, uh, uh, to switch over from, from it was analog-only broadcasting over the air to eventually digital-only broadcasting over the air. And in between those two times, the stations, the licensees, have had two different licenses. So t they've had twice as much spectrum so that they could dual cast both analog and digital. The analog is going away, and that's what's allowing this auction that's, that's going to raise perhaps 15 to $20 billion uh, early next year because what they're auctioning is um, our channels, channels on 52 to 69, the very high, high UHF channels, that are due to be cleared as of February 2009. So if that date slips because of fear about consumers not getting, not knowing about getting their DTV converter boxes or something, it'll be a real shame because every month that goes by, that spectrum is wasted as far as uh, using it for, particularly for uh, mobile broadband services, which is where it's going to. Can I, can I just add something yeah. quickly to that? Uh, just, just, it's important to note that the, the band Analog TV is going away, but it's not as though there's a ban for analog television per se. It's this, the spectrum is is from channels two to sixty nine, and each of those channels is either used by an analog or a digital station within a particular market, and it varies from market to market. And so, what what's happening is the the channels. Um, 52 to 69 are getting cleared out. Broadcasters will still have channels 2 to 51 minus channel 37. And, and there'll be a, a repacking process whereby the digital channels are, are reallocated. And I mean, many people have pointed out that there's no need to have that much space. You could pack them down into 80 megahertz, as Jim's paper shows, and have you know another, um, I don't know, 150 some or more, 200 or more additional megahertz. But, you know, that, that is not on the cards right now. What's just on the, on the table is the additional 108 megahertz. I just want to add one modification. All of this discussion is about the high power TV stations, the top 210 markets. There are about 1,500 of those stations, but there are also about 5,000 TV translator stations, and there is no hard deadline. They have both analog and digital rights indefinitely in the future. They're supposed to at some point be, but there is no. So th this is rural spectrum of great value. Uh, and I just I just want to call attention to that. There's also uh, about four gigahertz of spectrum used for electronic news gathering and their auxiliary service in the broadcast band. Most of that is analog, and though there's great pressure to get the broadcasters to move to digital on those bands, there's, there's no mandate. Uh, so. yeah, we'll take one here. Uh, Gary Arlen, if this is too esoteric, let's talk about it later. But uh, the arms merchants in this business, the companies like Motorola, Alcatel, Cisco, and others, who have a great deal of benefit from a whole new market opening up, any comments about where they play into the, the robbery the, the giveaway? M Motorola is probably an interesting case study to watch because while they certainly have a foot in the digital market for these you know, digital devices and, and they have a big, uh, you know, 
converter box business as well. They, they're also quite big provider to public safety systems. And public safety is another beneficiary of this transition because they'll get an additional 24 megahertz to use. So most of the debates about how to use the 700 megahertz that are going on right now involve in some way public safety potentially having more than that 24 new uh, megahertz because of plans like Frontline or other plans that call for public-private collaboration, uh, uh, spectrum that becomes both used for, for public safety and commercial use. So are you tracking them very closely? Yes, we, we're, we're following that and the lobbying behind it very closely. Yeah, I just want to uh, say something I didn't say, and that is it might be a good time for some of us to take another look at public-private financing and election practices uh, and ethics practices in Congress. <clears throat> Not only do you get good people elected for the future discussions of this who might do something in the public interest, but also to make sure that the revolving door issues are, are handled. And when I hear you talk about Motorola and some others, my mind goes to the drug deal that we had just a couple years ago. And there's a lot of data where congressmen and their staff simply went over to the pharmaceutical companies and are making millions and millions of dollars. And I think uh, the same kind of issue is here. Those who know about this value are going to figure out how to exploit it. And those of us who are only marginally aware of the value are going to be overwhelmed if we don't pay attention to getting good public officials elected who work in the common good, not just in uh, the special interest. And I'd just like to make one comment about the tragedy of vendor politics and spectrum. And the tragedy is, they, the vendors won't do anything that alienates their major customers. So to give you an example of how this results in really perverse behavior, it's in the interest of handset manufacturers like Motorola and Samsung uh, to have wireless carter phone. They have a, a stronger, but we cannot get a single one of those carriers, I mean vendors, to speak up because they don't want to alienate AT&T. Right. Chambers. It's real. They don't want to yeah. tick off. The, it, Gary said that the, really the, you know the poster shop for this, of course, is the Apple iPhone, right? Everybody wants, you know, would love to, you know, when you buy an iMac, right? You have you can buy it directly from Apple and connect it to any DSL or cable broadband service. It doesn't only work with Comcast cable uh, broadband, or it doesn't only work with AT and T's DSL. In half the country, but the iPhone you can only use with AT and T, and yet Apple is you know gagged as far as um, saying that they'd love to be able to have their usual business model of selling things to consumers, so that everybody in the country had the choice to buy one. Uh, and and in some parts of the country, then you don't even get AT and T mobile broadband, and so you can't use it at all. You keep going down the street and going to iTunes too. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add yeah, one point here as to public safety. I think the other half of what you said, Drew, is there needs to be much greater coordination between local, state, and federal government around the spectrum and public safety issues. I mean, so what if we reserve some of this for the way the Department of Homeland Security envisions it? We're not going to get anywhere if there's not coordination. Um, and it, it's a federal mandate. It's got to be really a command and control to make that happen. All right. Um. I was, uh, yes, you had your hand up earlier. Just w one last uh, question, and otherwise, you know, folks can come up. Yes? Um, uh, my name is Carrie Palmer. I'm from Green Technologies. And um, there's been some talk about smart radios, and, you know, so we're talking about you know, cognitive radio and software defined radio. And um, there's an IEEE working group working on an 802.22 standard that would be um, uh, basically instituting cognitive radio. And it there's talk that it would go into the 700 megahertz band that's that's opening up, or basically where um, the where the DTV, DTV transition is going into. And uh, I'm curious, what as uh, as you were saying, there's a lot of policy questions involved in um, when you start dealing with smart radios in a dumb radio uh, uh, spectrum uh, world. Um, what do you see how, how future allocations, future options are going to go, future policies? How do you think that's going to affect a smart radio world? Uh, well, first of all, smart radio is a very loose term. For example, our current mobile telephone 
has huge amounts of smart. Most bands are most smart radios are quad bands today. You can take them. They work with thousands of different geographical collations. They work in Europe today. They go from 800 megahertz to 1900. They can read different formats. Some of them can read the CDMA and the, the GSM and, 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 and whatever. So there's a lot of smarts here. However, it's still nux, nothing compared to the smarts that I think that, that the next generation will have. But there are significant obstacles. Let's say somebody wanted to really develop one of these smart radios. You have to go to the FCC currently and for every licensed band basically get a separate authorization. And you have to pay a fee. Well, first of all, that, you know, these are fast-moving, high-tech businesses. You have to submit something to the FCC, and your competitors know a year and a half, two years ahead of time to get authorized across literally hundreds of different bands. That's a huge barrier to entry. What I would propose for the era of smart radio is instead of regulation before the fact, where you have to get approval to manufacture a device, if you follow a protocol, you can build a product and get it into the market, if somebody misuses it, then there's, it's like speech. We don't have prior restraint. We don't, you don't get approval before you can you know, s speak. In the era of smart radio, I think we need to have ex post and ex ante uh, regulation. That's the biggest thing. And we have to reduce the burden of getting authorized across you know, with these flexible devices, all these different things. It's just too much of a burden going forward. I'll leave you with one, one mind-bending thought, perhaps, uh, in the spirit of when I said Jim's, you know, kind of, you know, always out ahead of the policy curve, and that is that, that really, you know, the development of these smart radio technologies, in other words, you know, Moore's, Moore's Law meets Marconi, uh, suggests that really licensing won't be needed in the future, because, you know, one, one of the things that we showed, uh, you know, a few years ago, measuring spectrum use over downtown Washington is only a tiny bit of the, of the airwaves are being used at any one time. And the only thing restricting, um, you, you know, restricting use is that it's zoned. You know, it's rigidly zoned. You need all these permissions and all these obstacles. So actually, if, if, if we had, you know, once, once it's affordable and more common to have what the military is developing with its next generation uh, smart radio sharing protocols, um, then all that capacity could be used, you know, on a, on a you know, on, where basically you, you know, you just see if a frequency, you quickly within 400 milliseconds see what's open and use it. And, and, and so there's going to be the ability, at least technologically, to share the airwaves so that everybody can do most of what they want without even, you know, worrying about uh, a, a lack of capacity. But we'll still have this huge political and policy bottleneck in front of that, and that's going to be one of the challenges when you get 10 and 20 years, I think, down the road. Well, thank you all for, uh, for joining us, and to Jim and the panel. Uh, and we'll, uh, if you're not on our list, be sure to sign up. Take a, take a Citizen's Guide poster and a copy of, our, of the paper for your colleagues. Thank you.